Well, good morning. Uh, thank you for allowing me to be here and undertake my favorite activity, which is listening to myself talk, <laughs> which I get to do for the next 20 minutes. And I'm going to leave some time at the end for some questions about the uh, presentation I'm about to give. I recognize some faces. Not everybody in town uh, may know of me and my story and why I'm here as a money manager talking about real estate. So let's get into the, uh, the topic with the discussion of just who the hell is Bill Valentine and why are we here listening to him? <laughs> Uh, so I'm the president of Valentine Ventures. We're a wealth management firm on the west side of Bend over in the uh, old mill district if you've ever seen us. We provide high net worth money management uh, services to individuals. We run two hedge funds and we have a small 401k offering for uh, small businesses here in town. By background, I'm an economist, an analyst, and a capital market behaviorist. And it's from the capital market behaviorist perspective that I'm here talking to you about real estate. The real reason I get asked to talk about real estate is something that happened back in 2006. I used to have a radio program in town called The Rich Life with Bill Valentine. It was on locally in KBND and it was syndicated through the Pacific Northwest. On March 19th of 2006, I came into my radio program that morning and I said, I will sell my house to anyone listening today as long as you lease it back to me. And people started calling and the phone lines lit up and they said, why would you do that? And I said, well, I think Bend Real Estate is a bubble and I think it's gonna burst, and you can ride my equity. We've had a great run, you can take me out of my house, I just need to lease it back to you because my wife doesn't want us to move. And it was a fun show and I got off the uh, air that Sunday, and the next Monday I went into work and I got a call from Dave Fisher, who used to write for the Ben Bolton, and Dave said, hey, I really wanna do, whoa, whoa, whoa now. <laughs> that was weird. Don't look at these. Don't look. <laughs> <laughs> that was really weird. Okay, so at any rate, um, Fisher called me and said, hey, I want to do a story about you and your idea of selling your house. Because right now, there's nobody in town who thinks that Ben Real Estate is going to go anywhere but up. I said, that's fine. So he came out, and this is the uh, article that was, was printed in uh, uh, March 26 of 2006, where uh, I explained my rationale for uh, why I thought Ben Real Estate was in a bubble at the time. It was not well received. My friends in the real estate community were uh, not shy about telling me to uh, pound sand. And... Uh, um, we actually took quite a bit of heat for it at the time, but I think the Bolton thought it was a cute idea and so they put this article up. What ended up happening, interestingly to Mr. Fisher, who was a great guy, um, was that in successive articles as real estate did in fact peak and begin to, to decline, um, Dave would call me up for information and the Bolton started to censor uh, my information because the Bolton started to lose a lot of revenue from real estate related businesses. If you were here in 2006, 2007, you know the Bolton was three fourths of the ads were real estate related. Unfortunately, Fisher got fired. He walked off the job over this particular issue. He and I remained friends, but neither of us are particularly friendly with the Bolton. <laughs> so, fall of 2006, housing peak. Um, can I just see a show of hands? Who was around 2006, 2007? Everybody was, pretty much. Okay. Well, we were all around. We're around. Well, I mean around here. <laughs> yeah. I was around. Here, okay. <laughs> so this housing peak uh, happened to me in fall of 2006. Obviously, this was not only a Bend event. This was uh, indeed a national and eventually a global event in the peak of housing. 2009, I was asked to be the keynote at the real estate forecast breakfast out at the River House by the Ben Chamber. I came up at the time and I said, uh, we are still, we still have one more leg to go downward and we uh, haven't resolved the issue which is that the nature of the bubble, which is not that real estate is not desirable, it's that we have a credit problem. Um, and we'll talk about that in just a second. In 2011, my wife and I bought property to build on, uh, and the property record that showed up um, in Deschutes County was seen by a writer at the Bolton, uh, Lily um, uh, McAloo, who's no longer writing for the Bolton. She called up and she said, I'm curious, you're the guy who, who told us about the bubble. You're buying back in. I said, yes, I'm buying back in. So this is 2011. So it's from this perspective, because I'm not in the real estate business, I'm not a realtor, I'm an investment manager, but I'm a behaviorist and a, and a, and a financial historian. It's from this perspective uh, that I'm, to this day, people contact me and they say, thank you for warning me about what happened. And boy, it's starting to feel similar today. Are we back in another bubble? 
In other words, they started to refer to me around town as Mr. Housing Bubble. <laughs> Anybody, anybody recognize this logo? I love this side. This is just off the internet. Take a bath in the real estate market with Mr. Housing Bubble. Free balloon mortgage inside. If I pop, you're screwed. Not affiliated with Mr. Internet Bubble. <laughs> So at any rate, so where are we today, and are we in fact back in another bubble? That's the heart of the speech that I'm going to give you right now. So this is a great chart. This shows the progression of real estate in Bend going all the way back to January 1997. So lots of similarities between what happened before and what happened now. Uh, for example, when you go back to about January or mid-2002, median home price in Bend, $166,000. Uh, by... Mid-2006, it's $396,000, an appreciation of 138% in the span of about four, four and a half years. Then, of course, we know what happened. Median home prices goes from 396 back down to 166 a decline of 58%. Unprecedented in modern times, domestically, in Bend, and globally. And guess where we were as of March of this year? Coincidentally, exactly 396000 on the median home price um, a month and a half ago. 138% appreciation, similar amount of time involved, begging the question, do we have a bubble? But it's not just in Bend, it's also happening nationally. So these are the case Schiller indices. I don't know if you guys follow these, but these are indices of real estate uh, behavior nationally. They have three indexes. The composite 10 is, is the 10 largest urban areas. The composite 20 is the 20 largest, but the national index is the one I'd have you focus on, which is the yellow line. You can see that, that the same, essentially the same thing that's happening in Bend is happening nationally. We are back to and have fully recovered from the popping of the bubble, leading to the question, are we in another bubble in Bend? To answer that question, you have to understand what the nature of a bubble is. And I've assigned five characteristics to all bubbles. And again, I'm not in the real estate business. I know a fraction of what you folks know about real estate. I'm a transaction real estate, but that's it. I sit at 10,000 feet and I look down at the behavior of markets. And bubbles exist outside of real estate. In my world, the stock and bond world, we've had bubbles going back 100 years, well documented. But you also have bubbles in all sorts of weird things like Beanie Babies. You remember Beanie Babies from you know 2000 or from the 1990s, right? You have these explosive prices, and right now we're getting a bubble in something called the Bitcoin. If you, if you follow the markets, we've had a doubling in the value of the Bitcoin this year alone, from $1,200 to $2,400 uh, um, per Bitcoin. Um, but all, all bubbles share similar characteristics, and so let's go through those so that we can try to ascribe what's going on today to the characteristics. First is the massive, unusual price appreciation. This is the thing that most people recognize with what happened before and what they see today, and that's why they're saying today, we must be in a bubble, because we've had that massive price appreciation. We indeed have had a massive price appreciation. Now, we're also coming from a very, very low base that was put in place in 2011. So to me, just going up 138%, getting back to the prior median peak is not necessarily, in and of itself, conclusive uh, proof of a bubble. But it is interesting to note that historically over the last 100 years in the United States, the price of residential real estate in the U.S. really only appreciates at 4% per year, slightly higher than the growth of money. And we won't get into the economics, although we can talk about it at the end if you want to understand why. It actually makes perfect sense to me that homes should grow at about a 4% appreciation over time. But we're talking about residential real estate. Real estate as an investment asset class usually comes with some form of yield. So I'm not talking about the return you would have gotten by buying a house and leasing it out or renting it out. That return includes the yield and the appreciation, but purely appreciation only, it's 4% over the long term. So when you see 138% over four years, yes, it is, it, is, it is staggering to see that. And it is a potential sign of a bubble, but in and of itself, it's not an indicative of the bubble. The second sign of any kind of asset bubble is ubiquity. Everybody's talking about, everybody's doing it, and everyone's an expert. Now, I will contrast today with 2006, 2007. I don't feel today that the ubiquity uh, explanation applies as much. 
I mean, in 2006, 2007, you know, you couldn't turn around without somebody telling you they were flipping, they were getting into real estate, they, you know, they were, you know, a 30-year actuary was going to become a real estate broker. I mean, it was all, everybody was getting into the field as quickly as humanly possible. Building, lending, selling, investing, everything was real estate. And everyone was an expert all of a sudden as well. Today, you have a little bit of that expert notion in that some people are talking about how they're convinced it's a bubble, and these are the same people who were convinced it wasn't a bubble last time. <laughs> in order for us as rational human beings to continue to perpetuate the behavior that creates the bubble, we have to create a rationalization in our mind. And that's when we come up with number three, which is the new paradigm. Some explanation for why something that normally grows at 4% is growing at 20% per year. So in 2006, 2007, we heard a lot about how this time it's different. And this is my favorite part of it of all time, which is the, the explanation that they're not making any more real estate. So that's the reason why real estate's exploding in, in appreciation, which is kind of a non-economist way of trying to sound like an economist. Because if you think about supply and demand, if you're making the point that because the earth, the sphere of the earth is, is constrained, it's not growing, um, and we can only build out the earth, and therefore there's so some kind of supply constraint on real estate, you're not considering the amount of unoccupied space on the earth that is not currently afforded real estate. There's an estimation that 3% of the surface value, uh, the surface area of the earth is occupied by urban residences. If you add in all rural, it's maybe 5%. So it's hard to make the case, and this is after 160,000 years of people being on the earth. It's hard to make the case that a 5% occupied sphere is uh, running up against some kind of supply constraint that justifies massive appreciation in real estate. Diminishing yield. Uh, when I talk to people in your field, I'm, I'm hearing this now commercial and residential. Cap rates are going down again. We're back in the sort of almost treasury bond level of cap rates for real estate, which is amazing. Threes and fours and fives, <laughs> right down from the sixes, sevens, eights, and nines that we saw at the bottom. Um, when I, in 2005, I toured Northwest Crossing when they were building it out, and David Ford, if you know David, uh, was out there showing me the properties. And I said, David, how many of these homes in Northwest Crossing are owned by out of towners? He said, 30% are owned by people from outside of Ben. I say, are they moving here? He said, no, they're just speculating on Ben real estate. I said, are they renting them out? He said, most of them not, don't really care. So they're betting on the come. They're, you know, the greater fool theory that they're just buying the property in, real, in Ben because Ben's desirable, therefore it's gonna go up. And that's part of what I started to say, hmm, this doesn't make sense to me. There's no yield to that property, right? And of course, as you know, many of those people unwound out of those properties many years later at a, at a significant discount to what they paid for it. So diminishing yield starts to go away in a bubble. But here's the fifth and most, uh, most important characteristic of all bubbles, and particularly germane to real estate and particularly germane to what's going on now, and we're gonna look at it in a little greater detail, and that's access. In order for a bubble to inflate, you have to have unique access and people need to get access to it. The internet bubble in stocks from 2000 to 2002 when that burst is a great example because if you recall what was happening in the late 1990s, we had the advent of the internet, we had computer trading for the first time, E-Trade, Scott Trade. We had Motley Fool, we had all these people online providing all this information. Commission rates went from real high levels to real low levels and everyone was becoming a day trader. At the same time, if you weren't in the field, you didn't notice this, but margin was becoming very, very easy to access. In other words, you could borrow against your own securities to buy more securities. That set up the bubble. So it was this ease of access that created the internet bubble that of course burst when technology stocks lost 80% of their value between February 2000 and mid 2002. In 2006, 2007, you remember the situation, subprime lending, collateralized debt obligations, all access and credit driven that allowed for prices to move up way too fast relative to the ability of builders to create more housing to uh, soak up all that excess demand. So, Mr. Housing Bubble, the real estate contrarian, is here to tell you we are not in another bubble. <laughs> um, the most important reason for that is credit. So this is the first thing. This is the market clearing itself. This is a chart you may have seen. This, this is mortgage delinquencies and foreclosures by period. 
Uh, you can, of course, see as the bubble's bursting in real estate, you have 30 to 60 day delinquent here, 90 day delinquent here, and full on foreclosure process. So banks have cleared their balance sheet. The Federal Reserve has helped clear some of that toxicity out. Um, so the credit problem, I mean, we're essentially back to where we were in a normalized real estate market today. We don't have an existing credit problem. Here's an even more interesting chart. This is mortgage origination by credit score. I dug this up on the internet the other night. I thought it was fascinating. So uh, I, it's kind of hard to see, but this is a bar chart that shows uh, at any given quarter, going back to 2003, the distribution of loans that were originated by credit score. And so what I've done is I've taken this one from first quarter 2007 and compared it to the most recent quarter, and I kind of broke those bars out over here. And what you can see is two things. Number one, just in terms of the amount of credit being issued today, yeah, about 40% more credit being issued in 2007 relative to today. That's good. That's less money coming into res residential real estate. But in terms of the quality of the borrower, it's changed dramatically. This represents the number of 760 scores or higher that were borrowing money in the first quarter of 2007. This is all credit scores below 760 in dollar terms. And then you see it today, this is the amount of lower credit scores versus higher credit scores. So the quality, you know, you know this intuitively. Anybody who's done a deal in the last three years knows it's not easy to get money the way it was before. You have to have a good credit score. This on top represents the amount of uh, issuance in trillions of dollars or in tens of hundreds of billions of dollars by uh, the type of loan from Alt A, which was just great the gray line right here, subprime in black, prime loans down here by private securities. So you got two things going on here is that one is the, the spike in, in you know, such a crappy loans aren't, aren't happening anymore and the amount of mortgage backed and federally backed loans is of course uh, taking over the marketplace. This is going to be impossible to read, but if you're not familiar with this, this is the St. Louis Fed Financial Stress Index. It's made up of seven interest rates, six measures of yield spread, and five other related measures. And so, less important than understanding and reading each of these uh, components to this index, you can see just graphically, you don't have to have an economics degree, that financial stress right now is at an all-time low. The system is overreacting to what happened last time around as a result. Credit's still super tight. Banks are very, very healthy today. This is why we don't have and are not going to have a bubble. That which is pushing prices up today is real money. It's cash, it's hard assets, it's dependable borrowers. So does that mean it's all up from here? No. Prices and activity will occasionally slow or even revert, you know, meaning decline based on changes in the economy, like recessions and rising interest rates. But the good news is the foreseeable future is best I can tell, and we can really only look out about 12 months with, with any degree of certainty, looks pretty good. And let me show you how that shakes out. So, and I can get you this information if you'd like, the New York Federal um, uh, Reserve Board of Analysts put together a snapshot every month of the economy. They typically include 12 to 15 charts that just kind of give a layman an idea of where we are in the economy. I took the most four most important charts out uh, just to show you based on last month where we are. First is, is employment, labor market. The blue line here represents the unemployment rate. We're at 4.4% unemployment in the United States. When I went to school back in the dark ages, my economics teacher taught us that 5% unemployment in the US was full employment that you don't normally get much below 5% because there's always attrition that's going on. So at 4.4%, you'd have to argue that the United States right now is fully employed. Now, people will take issue all the time with measures of unemployment, the measures of the marginally employed or the part-time worker who wants to be full-time or the full-time person who doesn't want to be doing the job they're doing. We can have that discussion after I get through the presentation. I like to talk about that kind of stuff. But this right here is the labor force participation rate. This is a big argument people make against the unemployment rate. They're saying the labor force participation rate is going down because disgruntled workers have pulled themselves out of the count that we use to come up with the unemployment rate. The idea that people are so disenfranchised and so disappointed about not being able to find work, they're out of the number, and the 4.4% unemployment rate is, is artificially low. Not true. That's a demographic point. 
There are a lot of people who would otherwise be included in the count of, of, of uh, the labor force who are retired. There are more people today, demographically, between 50 and 60, that are not working by choice than in any other time in our country's history. That's why the labor force participation rate is low. PCE deflator is a measure of inflation. There's lots of measures of inflation. This is the one the Fed uses. I think it's the best one. Personal consumption expenditure deflator. We won't go into the definition, but you can just see that since the 2008, the end of the, of the recession, we've been clipping along at a really, almost kind of the Goldilocks scenario for inflation at about 2%. So both the core PCE and the total PCE both at about 2%. That is the perfect amount of inflation in our system. It's the Fed's target. GDP growth, since the recession, we've only had two uh, blips of negative GDP growth. Collectively, we continue to be in a very strong position economically. And then disposable income and consumption. This is what drives the economy. We're at a really nice level right now of both income and consumption in the US. Now, does that mean the economy here is great and perfect and we're never gonna have a recession again? Of course not, but what I'm telling you is as best we can look out, this is not what a recession looks like 12 months before it happens. Here's the composite uh, of leading economic indicators. If you follow economics, you know that this is a measure of a variety of those indicators that will potentially tip us off. The most important of which is the stock market. If the stock market's rising, you tend not to have We've never had a recession in the next six months after a rising stock market, and you usually don't out as far as 12 months. So you can just see that the leading economic indicators, when it gets below 98, these are periods in time that have been associated with recessions, uh, and right now we're at 100. Same thing with the business confidence index up here. Again, you don't have to understand the components to understand we're on the high end of it, and consumer confidence right now is very high. So all three of these aggregate measures of the economy suggest we're not in or near a recession, which is good for real estate going forward. When we have a recession, economic activity will slow, real estate will slow, prices may revert. I'm not saying Ben real estate won't eventually go down median price to median price 10% or more. 58%? Never in your lifetime. That's over. You will never see anything that even begins to closely approximate a 58% decline in the prices of real estate in Bend in our lifetime. Rising interest rates, obviously, also a headwind against real estate activity. We all know this. But where I think I differ from most people is most people have the impression that interest rates are going to rise steeply and really put the skids on real estate activity. That's both inconsistent with history, it's inconsistent with everything I know about uh, interest rates, and it would do massive damage to our economy in a way that I'll show you in a second that's going to prevent interest rates from coming up dramatically in the U.S. This is a measure of the 10-year treasury rate in the U.S. back to 1870, believe it or not. I will show you two other periods of gradual increases in interest rates so you get some perspective on how long it takes for interest rates to go up. Between 1900 and 1920, basically during World War I, the 10-year yield went from 3% to 5%, a 2% increase from 3% to 5% over 20 years. So we're in the twos right now to get to four and a half, five, theoretically, using that example, 20 years. I don't know about you, but 20 years from now, I'm gonna be winding down my career. This is not a material risk to you and your business in the short term. This is not 30 years, this is a typo. 1940 to 1960, a 3% uh, increase in, in the yield of the 10-year treasury, again, over 20 years. So am I telling you it's gonna take 20 years for the interest rate to increase in the, in the treasury by 2%? Not necessarily, but it's not gonna happen in the next five the way that most people talk about it. The only time we've had a material spike in interest rate was on the back of hyperinflation, uh, that's, that's an exaggeration, high inflation during the 1970s. Those conditions do not exist today. The Federal Reserve will not be doing this to interest rates anytime soon. If you don't believe me that interest rates can stay down for forever, ask your friends over in Japan. When the United States, when we had the 10-year Treasury hit 2% in the U.S., you started to hear, well, this is not going to last forever. It's got to immediately turn. 2% is going to be the bottom on the 10-year Treasury. In 1998, the yield on the 10-year government bond in Japan hit 2%. We're now at zero. You know, it's approaching 30 years of, of, uh, of, of, of sub-2% uh, interest rates. We don't have to go back to five overnight. And here's the main reason why the Fed's going to do everything it can to both walk the line of increasing interest rates, but not do so in a way that hurts our economy. And that's because we have a huge amount of interest expense that the federal government pays as a percentage of our budget. 
Okay, so this is the federal debt. But what we're looking at here is just the amount of interest that we have to pay going back decades. So in 1960, we paid $6 billion in the interest that year on federal debt. In 1970, it jumped to 10, 50 billion, 264, 361, 413. We are now in 2006 at $432 billion in interest expense as a percentage of our federal budget. If you double interest rates, that's gonna to go to $800 billion. This is one of the reasons the Fed will be very reluctant to, to dramatically rise, it dramatically increase this rate anytime soon, which is good for you, which is good for you. Markets will put pressure on rates. Rates are coming up. I'm not saying rates aren't coming up. They're just gonna come up slower than you think and it's gonna do less damage to real estate than people tell you. So what does the future hold for our property values here in Bend? I'm gonna make the case that prices are virtually permanently headed higher because one, there are more people that want to and can move into Bend from cities with loftier prices than ours than the future supply of homes can keep up with. I'm gonna spend just a couple minutes on this. I'm from Minnesota. I moved to Bend in, 19, uh, in 2000, February of 2000. When I moved to Bend, it was because one of my clients from the Bay Area had moved here and I found it desirable to move my family up here. I, you know, when, when she first told me she lived in Bend, I was looking on the map. I said, I can't find it near Portland. Where the hell is this town? She said, no, 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 go, go east and go south. That's Bend. I'm like, well, that's cool. So I came up here and that was 17 years ago. I told all my friends, I'm going to Bend, Oregon. They said, where? Bend, Oregon. They're like, oh yeah, and then rain and the trees. No, no, this is this is high desert. Oh, okay, well, how cool. Um, flash forward. It's 2014. I had the, the opportunity to take my family and live in Europe for two years. We just got back seven months ago. Uh, we lived in Barcelona and we traveled around Europe. And every time we'd run into Americans in Europe, They'd say, where are you from? I'd say, Bend, Oregon. And their response was uniformly the same every time. Oh, you live in Bend? Oh, I want to be in Bend. And their eyes would just sort of look up to the sky. <laughs> Everybody knows about Bend. One of my best friends is Doug LaPlaca. He's the bastard most responsible for the fact that everyone knows about Bend. He ran Visit Bend with far too much club for far too many years. And as a result, brought every major athletic event conceivable in the world. You can't go around Bend 20 minutes without seeing somebody with a number pinned to their shirt today because of the push that Visit Bend has made over the last 10 years. Hooray, it's good for us, good for economic development, but everybody wants to come into Bend. And here's the problem if we want to talk economics. We do have a supply problem in Bend. We're constrained one side by national force and three sides by an urban boundary. That urban boundary is not going to move fast enough to accommodate a fraction of the growing demand for the people who live in places that are more expensive than Bend who want to get here. Let's overlay that with the fact that technology allows us to work anywhere today. We used to call it telecommuting. You don't even hear that term anymore, right? I, mean, I don't even know what a telephone is anymore. It's a computer, right? People can work from anywhere. And there are people in Seattle, Portland, San Francisco, L.A., Boulder right now scheming plotting, finding, trying to find ways to come into Bend. How much added supply can we really provide those folks so that they don't come in here and materially lift up prices? And oh, by the way, most of those folks that are coming in from those cities are gonna do bring in a ton of equity or cash because they're able to sell uh, their places where they live now and they have the economic means by which to do so. And they're gonna compete with and continually push out the middle class. Bend is no longer gonna be uh, a, a welcoming place for the middle class homeowner, uh, and that will not change. Second point I want to make is that if you want to see where we're headed, look to exclusive mountain towns, and I'll show you some data on that in just a second. So here's where they're coming from. And what I've got here is a comparison of the median home price of major metropolitan areas on the West Coast that we have already dem uh, demonstrated for having interest in, my in migration into Bend. These are the big cities that uh, they're coming in from. San Jose, Sunnyvale, San Francisco, so that's the Bay Area. Then you got Anaheim and a little bit lower, you got LA, um, San Diego, Boulder, Seattle, obviously, Denver. Interesting to note, we're now more expensive than Portland, which is which was fascinating when I started to dig this up. But you have ratios of median price on places where, in some cases, you know, they can a person can sell a place in the Bay Area, come here and literally get twice the place for the same amount of money, or in most cases, they're stepping down getting a higher quality place, less square footage, for half the price and keeping the difference. All right, 
pretty obscene some of those places, right? Check out the new uh, level of price by which we're going to be comparing ourselves. These are the towns that I think most represent where Bend is heading. Ketchum, Idaho, median home price $935,000, 1.4 times Bend. Teton Village in Wyoming, 849, Vail, 831, you can read. Um, all of these towns represent the same features that Bend has. There's a mountain there. It's in the west. It's desirable. It's on everyone's radar screen. It has worldly accoutrement. I mean, that's what Bend is, right? There's no other town of 85,000 people that has a venture conference, a film festival, world-class restaurants, golfing, skiing. You know the argument. You make these arguments all the time to out-of-towners. We have these great features. So do some of these places, and look where they have ended up in a medium price basis. Now, I will tell you, these. there's a lot of differences between us and some of these places. We're bigger than some of these places. We have more economic activity. We should be... Uh, you know, we're not going to become catch them overnight. We're not going to 935 anytime soon. But I think this is the model for where we go from here um, in Bend. And is that a good thing or a bad thing? I'll let you decide. This is the this is the this is the this is the future that we've created for ourselves. I mean, the business of Bend for as long as I've been here is promoting the business of Bend. Whether it's the angel groups that are trying to bring investor capital in here, the tech community that's trying to create hubs of activity, visitor bend, trying to bring tourists, buyers, that's great. Again, I love it. We all benefit. The stuff you can have in this little town is phenomenal. This is a wonderful place. Um, but um, it's the nature of what we are. This has not been from 1980 anymore. This has not been from 2000 anymore. We're a different place and we're going to be a different place. Closing thoughts. I always say this, I could be wrong about some or all of this. Second closing thought, not a popular one, affordable housing will not materialize in Bend. I'm not anti-affordable housing, I'm all for affordable housing. I'd love to think that we could have a stratified amount of income versus housing in town where we can employ a lot of our labor uh, community here and our teachers and our municipal workers and our government workers in Bend, it's going to become increasingly elusive. We can throw money at affordable housing. I've studied capital markets for 30 years. You will not demonstrably affect the price mix of rentals by putting a thousand units of affordable housing in and putting a price restriction on those units. It's just not going to happen. We'll put a thousand people in reasonably priced housing. Great for those thousand people. The other 85 or 90 are not going to feel it. This is a pipe dream. I'm not saying don't do it. I'm just telling you affordable housing. We'll never have a significant affordable housing community in Bend. I blame some of the condition for Bend on city leadership in the, in the 20 years, or the 17 years, 18 years that I've lived here. Uh, leadership at the city level, both elected and non-elected, the, the so-called community leaders have done a terrible job. I will cite Juniper Ridge. I will cite the purchase of the Bend Bulletin lot that's over by the highway. Uh, that sat there. I will. Uh, I will cite the placement of the Oregon State Community Campus uh, in in the West Side neighborhood as examples of the city not really understanding. I will. I will. I will use it as an example. The multi-million dollar um, uh, water flow that's now on Colorado as a priority. I think. I think our our, uh, our leadership is, is is bad. I'm just making that opinion. Okay. My final point to you is remember the lessons from last time around, 2006, 2007. When I, gave up, uh, when I got up and gave the uh, speech at the real estate breakfast, I talked about la cucarachas. The idea that what was happening in 2007, 2008 is we turned on the lights and all of a sudden we saw in the real estate community all the cockroaches. Tammy Sawyer, 1031 Summit Accommodators, right? I mean, this, it, that's what happens in a greedy bubble. People get like, oh, I just got to have more, 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 more. And I always think like, why? Well, things are so, I mean, nobody has it easier than us. This whole room, right? We're healthy. We live in America. It's 2017. We do jobs where there's a very low probability we're going to get our hand cut off today at some point during our workday, right? We all make and live in a wonderful place. Why would you steal money? Just never made sense to me. Plenty of money for us to be around. <laughs> Number two, don't listen to the experts, including me. I could be wrong or about some or all of this. All these people that are telling you that this is a bubble now, I will tell you none of them thought so before. They all told me I was full of shit at the time. Don't listen to any of this nonsense. If you're excellent, it won't matter if real estate declines by 10%, interest rates come up, 
it becomes more competitive to you as more people rush to become a member of the Central Oregon Association of Realtors. If you're excellent, it won't matter. If you were doing this in 2006, 2007, you're still doing it now, you have everything it takes to get through anything in the next 20 years. Just keep doing it well. Final point, don't take your clients for granted. I'm starting to see this anecdotally, not necessarily because I'm not dealing with the real estate industry so much, but you're seeing behavior in the building trade that's reminiscent of 2006, 2007, contractors that aren't showing up, I got a little too much work to do, if you don't like it, don't take it, I'm gonna raise my price, then I'm gonna underdeliver on the promise. In the business community around here, I can't get a lawyer to return my call at a reasonable time. You know what, they got a lot of business right now. Bend is thriving, well that's great, good for you. But that doesn't mean you still shouldn't be good at getting back to people quickly. Don't take for granted that what, that what you have now will always be here. Um, be responsive. In other words, stay classy, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, questions, comments, rebuttals, rebukes.